it is time now to talk with one of our favorite, if not our single most favorite football guest, Mike Golick Jr., college football analyst, talk show host with his daddy on uh, DraftKings. And a good afternoon to you, sir. How you doing? Good afternoon. Appreciate you having me back. Always a ton of fun. Man, uh, can we start with this Notre Dame linebacker that the Cowboys drafted, Maris Leofi? I'd love to get your thoughts on what what kind of a, a NFL career you think awaits him. Yeah, you know, Maris I, I turned himself into an incredibly productive player in South Bend, was a leader in the middle of a defense that had a ton of NFL qualities about it under Al Golden. And I think for people in the NFL drafting players on that side of the ball, while Al's there, especially along with Marcus Freeman, you're going to see high football IQ. These guys are used to wearing a bunch of hats and playing roles. For Maris, the things I can say specifically about him, that knows for the football thing kind of gets overblown sometimes. It's hard to quantify but he really is a guy that always finds his way to the action, really good at diagnosing plays, a good enough athlete with some great closing speed to help track guys down. I thought really actually in the last couple of years of his career there too, really strong pass rush wiggle for a place in Dallas that you know got pretty spoiled when Michael Parsons went from off-ball linebacker to yeah. turning into one of the most ferocious pass rushers in the entire league. He's not going to do that for you by any stretch, but he is a guy in sub-packages. I thought – would probably be the place that non special teams where he was able to make an impact for Dallas for uh, the soonest. So uh, I think high football IQ, really good closing speed, certainly not afraid to come up and thud somebody by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that combined with in this day and age, being a guy that can run well sideline to sideline and be a value add on passing down going towards the quarterback, all that stuff seems to fare pretty well. Yeah, he's looked fantastic in preseason. I, I know, like the rest of us, you're getting geeks for college football. We'll definitely chat some of that. But this is a weird year, it seems like, for our Cowboys. You don't have Dak Prescott extended. Mike McCarthy's going into a lame duck season. CeeDee Lamb is still unsigned. I'm curious your expectations for the Dallas Cowboys as we get ready for 2024. Yeah, you know what? Becoming friends with David Hellman, who obviously you know everyone in Cowboys Nation knows pretty well, does a great job over at Fox. I talk with him. He's like my Cowboys translator. Because anytime I'm like, hey, how much of this is the media machine that Jerry Jones has built up and the interest economy around that team? And how much of it's actually real? And for the most part, he's pointed out that historically, things still tend to get done, even if it looks and feels harder. We saw that most recently with my buddy Zach Martin last year, Mm -hmm. where it took a little while, even for him, a guy who's a future ring of honor, gold jacket, everything that we know Zach is, it took even a little extra effort for him to go get paid. And so, Once you see something like that enough times, you understand that it's more par for the course, even if I don't think it's good business practice to treat your star players like that in a place that prides itself on treating its star players, especially post-career, pretty darn well. So, yeah, I think it's kind of obscured what I think is still a very good football team. They've got to answer for the sins in the postseason. That's the reality, and that's something they've earned through the recent years, not just the history since the triplets, but I I think – overall the effects like that where you see Micah Parsons getting involved in that stuff in the conversation for a guy that again like CD is going to get paid by this team those two are not walking out the door the Dak situation is a little more complicated than that now I think based on what Dak could have on the other side of the rainbow if he chooses to pursue that but for those two guys they're going to be there for Micah Parsons it could be a little bit more difficult road like his peers that he's seen but at the end of the day they're still there they're still going to play this season and even though the Cowboys have questions to answer, although, you know, hopefully some of the uptick in Mossy Smith production maybe mm-hmm. helps out the run defense. Offensively, we'll see if the youth on the offensive line can offset the fact that they didn't address running back in the way people thought they should this offseason. It's still going to be a double-digit win football team. Hey, Mike, I, I really thought Notre Dame guys were smart, and the fact that you've enlisted Hellman to help you, I think, is a huge mistake. <laughs> you know, as a, as an L, as a LSU guy with Hellman, I, I just kind of question your smarts. Maybe you should have gone to school with us at LSU uh, with that type of thinking, but you did bring up the offensive line, and I wondered what your thoughts were. In the NFL in this day and age, can you go with two rookies of your five and function well in the National Football League on your offensive line? You know what? It's certainly difficult. I think, you know, they're, they're sort of separate cases because Cooper coming in playing as much football as he did at the college level, playing a position like center where when you've got a quarterback that's as capable and smart as Dak Prescott is, when Zach Martin is to your right who's seen a ton of football is an incredibly high IQ guy, some of the more difficult parts mentally of that position are going to be handled, I think, at least a little bit by other people at the beginning for Cooper. Physically, 
center is usually one of the easier positions to slot in on the offensive line. I say that as someone that snapped the ball for a while during my career, Mm -hmm. you've got a lot more help. And so you're going to have those advantages there. You're next to two of the best in the business and Tyler and Zach. So that's going to go a long way too. And with Tyler Guyton, it really is a testament to what the Cowboys, despite all the, the things that we, you know, talk about them as flawed publicly and the way they deal with certain things, man, they can identify and draft quality talent and get them coached up quick on the offensive line. Because Tyler Guyton was a dude I wasn't in love with coming out of Oklahoma. Sure. I saw the tools that would make him incredibly enticing to a pro team, but it seemed far off. The motor sometimes seemed inconsistent. Some of the technique was certainly lacking. And you just see the benefit of being in a room that knows how to do this with quality veteran pieces there, like Zach and quite honestly, like Tyler Smith, who came in as a guy that was a little more raw of a prospect coming out of Tulsa, but got up to speed quickly. And what I've seen, you know, I, I know the reports out of camp, there's been good days and bad for Tyler, but seeing what made its way to the stadium for the preseason games, hearing the stuff as of late, it seems like they've done it again. He'll have a few more rough moments because technically there's still some spots he gets himself into trouble, but you see more often than I saw on the Oklahoma tape, his gifts helping get him along with the right. better, you know, the better coaching he's received up out of some of those bad spots. To my goalie junior here with you on 105.3 The Fan. I'm picking Cowboys in the East. I think Philly's going to be more down this year than last. What do you think? Uh, I disagree with that. I actually think Philly, I, I don't know how they could be, especially, you know, I know the beginning of the year we felt like they were on borrowed time. That 10-1 and record might not have been indicative. But I'll give them credit. They went out and addressed damn near every deficiency they had in the offseason somehow, some way. Will it be good enough to get them back to the Super Bowl? That I would probably stop short of. But they're going to be competitive in the East. Again, the defense has Vic Fangio at the helm, who's proven commodity with a bunch of new guys and young guys there. Offensively, I think getting a little bit of new life injected into a scheme that had become a little stale with still a bunch of talented players means that team's probably going to do pretty well. I think it's a two-horse race in that division. I'd probably still lean Dallas if you put the gun to my head right now, but I do think that one is going to be pretty close because Philly Ants with the bell this off. There was a piece last week from ESPN. Some people feel like it was too toxic and it overplayed the relationship between uh, Sirianni and, and Hertz. What, what, do you, what do you think about the, the chemistry in Philadelphia? Uh, you know, I think like anything else, when there's as much smoke as we've seen over the last, you know, however many, you know, like year and a half now from that, there's probably a good bit of fire on that. Nick Sirianni seems like a different cat at head coach, right? Some of the ways he's conducted himself, even publicly, that we get to see has not been what we normally see from head coaches in the NFL. But that being said, you're going to have a little bit of buffer in there right now. I mean, anyone that's played ball will tell you, you're only even as the starting quarterback spending so much time with the head ball coach. Most of it's with your position coach. Most of it's with your offensive coordinator. We saw the areas, listen, last year when Nick started to get a little bit too familiar again with a lot of that, that was when the trouble started. Some of the best times in Philadelphia are when Nick decided to let go and let Shane Steichen control the offense, be more of the CEO. And so if he can get back to and stick to that, I think some of this stuff is mitigated. But there's no doubt there's a little bit of discomfort that we've seen work its way out publicly. All right, it is uh, just a few days away here, Gojo, from the college football season kicking off. It's It's been a bunch of change. All right, we got Texas OU in the SEC now. We got a 12 team playoff. Well, what do you think? What, what are some of the things that are headlines for you as we get ready to start a new college football season? Yeah, no, I, I think you, you start off there personally. And if you'd have told me a couple of years ago when we started hearing about all this conference realignment news and stuff like that, that you would have two teams, one in Texas walking into the SEC and the other in Oregon walking into the Big Ten, that would be as equipped to come in and compete to win the division right off the bat as those two teams are. I'd have been pretty stunned, but it's a testament to what Steve Sarkeesian and Dan Lanning have done, going to incredibly well-resourced programs, but getting them to a place now where depth-wise and along the lines of scrimmage, where those two leagues in particular thrive, to that place, it's pretty darn impressive. Outside of that, I mean, You look in the state of Texas for you guys outside of Austin. Listen, Notre Dame's getting ready to go down to Kyle Field, Texas A&M, week one of the season, and test out a group that is real interesting. I know a lot of NFL folks that are really high on Connor Wegman. Should he be able to stay healthy? I think Mike Elko can coach his ass off. And that guy with the kind of talent they have there, I think it's only a matter of time before they're in a much better place overall than where they were towards the end of the Jimbo Fisher era. So I think that situation – And then the other one for me is super interesting, Penn State. Like, the expanded playoff, it's now or never for one of the most tradition-rich programs in college football to break through that ceiling that's been on them in the shape of Ohio State and Michigan for a while. So those are a few that are interesting. Obviously, Ohio State, Georgia, 
Penn in the college football playoff right now. How they get there will be interesting, but they're going to be there. There's just too much talent on those teams. What's Oklahoma have to do to get back in the mix for the playoff picture? And um, you know, yeah, let's just go there. You know, are, are you? Are, do you think we'll see that for sure now that they're going to the SEC? Uh, yeah, I think it'll get there eventually. This year's going to be tough just because you graduated so much talent off the offensive line. And Bill Beanbow is one of the best offensive line coaches in college football at Oklahoma with Venables. And so I trust that he's going to get that room up to speed. But it's just one of those years timing-wise. You don't want to be walking into this conference trying to microwave success with a new group on your offensive line right out of the gate. That's tough sledding. The defense, I think, is getting closer to the Venables stuff that we saw at Clemson. I think this year could be a big step forward for them and Jackson Arnold's got a bunch of talent but yeah I, I trust that they're dedicated enough to this and have the right people to make it work I just think their path forward because of that O-line reset is a little tougher right this year than it is for a place say like Texas that's bringing back four of their five starters and a guy in Kelvin Banks who's probably a top five pick if you're a fan of like you know TCU Baylor Tech and and you're you know, you're staying back here. Is this a better experience as a fan when a slightly less conference have a better chance of making the playoffs here with the expanded field? Uh, yeah, you know what? Listen, it, it's no doubt going to take a little bit of a hit because we all want to feel like we're a part of the big conversation. And if you're not in the SEC or the Big Ten, there's a feeling of being left out. But your, your point, the Big 12 is really deep with teams that could make it interesting. And while all of these teams, the Power Four conferences and the highest-ranked Group of Five champions, all have a direct avenue to the playoff, that's an incredible opportunity right now. You know, you look at the Big 12, Utah coming in with a veteran team is always a tough out under Kyle Whittingham. Kansas State looks like they're going to be a tough out again as usual under Chris Kleiman. But there's a lot of other teams you just mentioned within shouting distance. And so if you've got a chance and you've got a viable path to the playoff, then, yeah, there is something to be said for clearing out a couple of those teams that would have made that conversation a little more muted. With all the conference movement and expansion, do you think your fight in Irish Notre Dame will always stay independent, or do you think eventually they're going to need to join the Big Ten or whatever conference they'd like? I think I always call it football Pangea. When we finally get the one big super conference that everyone's playing in and it's like 60 yeah. teams and we're yep. basically doing the – I think that'll probably be it for Notre Dame as long as they've got a viable opportunity, kind of why I chose the language I did with that Big 12 conversation. Notre Dame, it's always been, hey, is our TV money comparable? And do we have a pass to the championship? And while they can't get the first round by in this structure and they've got to sacrifice some on that front, the other two things are still satisfied, and that's all that really matters in South Bend. We'll see if as the playoff continues to change structure, maybe it becomes harder for them to get that at-large bid. Maybe you do get more automatic bids for some of the bigger conferences as we go forward. And if that does, Notre Dame, new athletic director, Pete Mbakwa, they're going to make the right decision to keep Notre Dame competitive in those areas. And if they eventually have to join a conference, I'm not going to lose much sleep over it because it's been a part of their identity, but it's certainly not the bulk of it. Gojo podcast on DraftKings. We thank you so much. We're a big fan of your football brain. Is there anything else that uh, we can mention for you before we uh, say goodbye? No, all good, fellas. I appreciate it. We're 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern Monday through Friday on the DraftKings Network. We're having a blast. So we're uh, hoping more people stop by for a fun fall. 